that the OECD and the ECA are organizing uh, jointly to present you QSR Toolbox version 4, what is new, the new functionalities, and uh, some uh, even more advanced functions and the uh, use cases that um, are available with the tool. So um, this is uh, the agenda for uh, today. It, uh, the webinar will last around uh, two hours and a half. I will give you a very brief introduction. Then uh, OECD will uh, present basic concepts and organization of the QSAR toolbox. Then we will have a first Q&A. Then uh, uh, the presentation will go back to ECA and uh, we will, uh, with the toolbox on the screen, uh, we will propose you some uh, use cases of situation that we think are, can be uh, faced and, uh, and solved with the toolbox. Then uh, in the middle of our webinar, we will have a 10 minutes break. And then uh, we continue by showing on the screen uh, some advanced functionalities of the toolbox. And then we foresee after that um, 25 minutes of discussion before uh, our closing remarks, first from ECA and then from OECD. So uh, we want to, to have enough time for Q&A and a discussion. And uh, I will uh, um, illustrate to you soon how we are going to handle it. But first, I wanted to introduce you the uh, presenters of uh, today. From the OECD Environment, Health and Safety Division, we have Eva Leila, Principal Administrator for both the Hazard Assessment Program and the Risk Reduction Program in the Environment, uh, Health and Safety Division of the OECD. Eva is leading uh, projects uh, which include uh, combined exposure assessment, integrated assessment, and testing case studies. Predictive approaches such as QSAR, hazard assessment methodologies, dissemination tools, and also risk reduction projects. She holds a PhD in biochemistry. We have uh, Yuki Sakuratani, administrator at the OECD, being in charge of quantitative structure activity relationships and hazard assessment. In 2014, he joined the OECD where he's running two projects, QSAR Toolbox Management Group and the Integrated Approaches to Testing and Assessment, IATA, Case Studies Project. He holds a PhD in engineering. From the Computational Assessment and Dissemination Unit in ECA, uh, we have uh, four people. There is Irman, Scientific Officer at ECA for almost 10 years. With a background in chemistry and ecotoxicology, Doris is working for the promotion of the correct use of alternatives for environmental endpoints. She contributed to the further development of the ACDQSR toolbox since 2008. We have Alberto Martina Paricio, scientific officer at ECA for more than nine years, working mainly in the application and assessment of QSARs and read across, both for environment and human health. He has participated in the toolbox project from ECA's perspective since 2008. We have Tomasz Sowanski, QSAR Toolbox Project Manager in ECA, working in the agency for over eight years. Tomasz's activities are mainly focused on the worldwide promotion of the correct use of alternative methods. He holds a PhD in biomedical engineering. Then there is myself, Andrea Gissi, working in ECA for more than four years. I contribute to the further development and promotion of the QSAR Toolbox and other non-testing methods. Uh, I'm also involved in screening and prioritization of substances and scientific data analysis. I have a uh, medicinal chemistry background, a PhD in computational toxicology. So uh, I was mentioning that uh, we wanted to have an exhaustive uh, Q&A and a discussion. Uh, how is this going uh, to happen? Uh, please do not send us uh, questions uh, via WebEx but ask question through the Slido application. It works quite well on phones and tablets, so I suggest you with your smartphone to go to the website and then type the code toolbox. Uh, once uh, you get in, you are allowed uh, to ask questions and uh, to upvote or downvote uh, uh, questions made uh, from other people. What we are going to do in the Q&A and in the discussion, we are going uh, to tackle the questions that get uh, the most uh, votes. Of course, this uh, um, possibility to have questions, there will be also during uh, the break and during the presentation, so anytime you can just ask uh, from there. Um, this is the first time we are using the tool. Uh, we will see if you appreciate that. We are going to use it also for the future events. Uh, we started by opening uh, uh, a pool uh, before um, the start to check which topics you would like to see more in details. 
and uh, we decided uh, to expand our presentation on uh, data querying and metabolism because these were the two topics that uh, you voted uh, the most. Now we have another pool open uh, to get some suggestions on how to further improve the toolbox. Um, just one slide before the start. Uh, I um, want to point out that this webinar uh, uh, will uh, uh, cover some of the basic functionalities of the toolbox, but it's more meant uh, for uh, um, to, to show also advanced functionalities. Therefore, those of you that uh, are seeing the toolbox for the first time should complement what they learn today from other material that is already available uh, in different websites. The, the, the starting point, in my opinion, should be the tutorials. Uh, that really explain how to use the toolbox. Uh, here you have the link. Then uh, there is a video from the ECA IT tool training for the stakeholder day 2017, where we have shown uh, the basic functionalities and practical examples with toolbox version four. And then uh, there are uh, illustrative examples, uh, again, uh, on ECA website that uh, explain the reasoning behind a uh, prediction. And one of these examples is also available uh, as a video on YouTube at the link that you can find uh, below. So having said this, it's uh, the time for the first uh, presentation. And therefore, I will give the floor to Yuki from OECD for that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Hello, everyone. I'm going to present basic concept and organization of the Tusa toolbox. First of all, I would like to introduce environment health and safety division of OECD. The overall aims of our division is to protect health and the environment while avoiding duplication of effort, ensuring that efficiencies are made, barriers to trade avoided. The OECD works with member countries and other stakeholders to improve and harmonize chemical assessment methods. To promote regulatory use of non-testing methods is one of the most important work areas. The QSA toolbox is a free software application to estimate missing experimental values of chemicals by internationally harmonized methods. It's co-owned by ECA and OECD and maintained by OECD member countries, updating one or two times per year. And already is widely used and supported by governmental organization, research institution, and industry, which has about 11,000 users. The QSA Toolbox version 4.0, which was released in April, has significantly improved its usability and functionality. This presentation introduces the best concept and organization of the QSA toolbox showing examples of the data capturing for skin sensitization. Mechanism of skin sensitization is described in an OECD guidance document of adverse outcome pathway, AOP. The AOP of skin sensitization consists of four key events. That is, molecular interaction with skin proteins, inflammatory response in keratinocytes, activation of dendritic cells, and T-cell proliferation. For example, leach requirements are consistent with the key events. Four key events, four key events, one, two, three, in vitro or in chemical test methods, addressing each of the key events are required 
OK rainfall in the drop study is required. There are several databases in the QSAT box to obtain such experimental data, as shown here. This is an example of such result of experimental data by the QSAT box. Uh, this is a target chemical, and the endpoints are organized in a tree called endpoint tree. As can be seen, this target chemical has data for several studies, including in vitro and in vivo studies. And you, you can refer test conditions and data source of each study. However, experimental data are not always available for a target chemical. In such a case, it is recommended that to consider using alternative measures in order to avoid unnecessary animal testing. Weed approach based on chemical category is a non-testing method to estimate a toxicity of, the, of a target chemical based on analog chemicals of the target chemical. And the main target of the QSAT box is to help to conduct weed approach based on chemical category. These are some uh, description of chemical category and weed across. In the guidance document on grouping chemicals. That is, chemicals whose physical chemical, toxicological, and ecotoxicological properties are likely to be similar or follow a regular pattern as a result of structural similarity may be considered as a group or a category of chemicals. For category member that lacks data for one or more endpoints, the data can be filled in a number of ways, including by weed across from one or more other category members. And the key points are similarity in chemical structure, observable toxicity, and toxicity mechanism. And uh, this is an example of chemical category for skin sensitization. This target chemical has no experimental data, but there are three analog chemicals with in vivo skin sensitization data. These analog chemicals have similar structural feature to that of target chemical based on common functional group. And all these analog chemicals have uh, all these analog chemicals show positive results in in vivo skin sensitization studies. So the uh, toxicological effects of the analog chemicals are similar. So you can fill the data gap of the target chemical as positive by weed across. A weed across result needs to be reported to show the reliability. This is a reporting format for read across described in the grouping guidance document. In the reporting format, you need to explain the hypothesis for read across 
for example, toxicity mechanism information shared by category members. And the hypothesis needed to be justified by using experimental data of analog cameras. In this respect, the QSAP toolbox helps users to find chemical group for readables, as well as information or support data needed for reporting the readables. A tool of the QSAT toolbox called Profiler identified structural features causing toxicological effects. There are 65 profilers in the QSAT toolbox version 1.0. And uh, one of the profilers has 99 categories of protein binding structural alerts. If you conduct profiling the target chemical by using the profiler, the profiler identified a functional group that can cause protein binding. And you can refer the mechanism of protein binding by the functional group. This functional group can be used for the hypothesis for, lead, for grouping because protein binding is the first key event, molecular key event of AOP of skin sensitization. And then you can get experimental data from the databases in the QSAT toolbox for the chemicals grouped by a profiler. And you can confirm the toxicological similarity of the group of chemicals together. If the group of chemicals, chemicals show similar toxicity, you can consider conducting miracles. If the group of chemicals doesn't show similar toxicity, you need to consider another way, such as subcategorization. I explained a way for grouping chemicals based on functional group. Another way is based on common metabolite, as described in the grouping guidance document. QSAR toolbox can also help to find a chemical group based on common metabolite. The QSAR toolbox has metabolic simulators and metabolism databases, these can identify the metabolites of a target chemical and chemicals in databases. And the providers of the QSAT box can identify structural alerts of metabolites. So you can make a group of chemicals based on common metabolite is a common structural alert. Now I would like to show the workflow of the QSAT box. The workflow of the QSAT box consists of six parts and there are modules corresponding to each part. That is, input, profiling, data, category definition, data gap filling, and report. 
I'm going to briefly demonstrate the role of each module. First one is input module. In this module, you can specify your target chemical by different ways, such as cast number, chemical name, and the chemical structure. In this case, a target chemical was specified by drawing its chemical structure. The second one is profiling module, where you can see profiles. If you select an endpoint in the endpoint tree, profiles related to the endpoint are highlighted. You can select profiles you like. In this case, it is shown that this target chemical has structural alert of protein binding by acylation. These are the types of 65 profilers in the QSA toolbox version 4.0. The third one is data module. In this module, you can find experimental data of your target chemical. Forty-nine database. Uh, there are forty-nine databases in the QSAT box version four point uh, It contains about. 2 million data points for 79,000 chemicals. In this case, two databases of indoor skin sensitization are selected. However, no experimental data for the target chemical is not formed. So we need to consider conducting data capturing by reader. First one is category definition. In this module, you can search other chemicals by using profilers and metabolism simulators. In this case, analog chemicals having, func having a functional group causing protein binding by acylation are gathered by using a protein binding profile. The fifth module is data gap filling module. In this module, you can confirm the toxicological similarity of the group of chemicals gathered. In this case, all other chemicals show positive result in in vivo skin sensitization study. So you can conduct data gap healing by miracles. The last module is report module. All operations so far are recorded. So you can semi-automatically produce read across report to submit, for example, each situation. I explained basic functionality. However, a lot of new 
functionality while developed in Kyushatu Group version 4.0. I'm going to highlight a few of new functionality. In profiling module, a prioritization tool was implemented as, as a profiler. You can get CBE classification, for example, by a decision tree. And new interface of metabolism map was implemented. This is a Metapass software. Qualitative information of parent chemical and metabolites are available. In data gap filling module, automated workflow AW and standardized workflow SW were implemented. These are the functionality for beginner users. For automated workflow, you can get data gap filling result by only specifying your target chemical and target endpoint. On the other hand, for standardized workflow, some options are provided step by step to contact these workers. This functionality is limited to some endpoints of skin sensitization and short term toxicity to fish. You can download the QSA toolbox version 4.0 from our website, as well as guidance documents and training materials. You can get to the help desk and public forum from this website. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Hello. So thank you, Yuki, for uh, your uh, presentation. And uh, I, I will ask OECD if, uh, for this Q&A session they can give the presenter rights to ECA2 uh, so that I can show the top voted uh, questions before moving to the use cases uh, from Doris. So I see that uh, I should be able to share the screen now. Okay, so the most voted uh, question so far is uh, whether the toolbox also indicates if uh, the QSAR results that they present are within the applicability domains of uh, the training set and the uh, methods. And, uh, 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 Yuki or Eva, do you want to answer this question? Yes. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the result of visa cross by QSATOR box. Uh, you can confirm the uh, applicability domain or the category by different ways. For example, you can see the uh, training set of the provider uh, used for the categorization. And uh, you can obtain a lot of parameters 
オブアナログケミカルいうギャラと。That is,、uh, the answer is yes.、Uh, you can confirm the applicability domain of the category by、uh, a lot of、uh, structure, a lot of boundaries. Okay, Yuki,、uh, thank you. Maybe, yes, indeed,、uh, we can、uh, also underline the distinction、uh, that in the toolbox、uh, there are、uh, QSAR results from、uh, external models, and for these、uh, results, like e p i s w i t h models. So when the toolbox runs、uh, a prediction, and I think Alberto is going、uh, to show something about this,、um, we, don't have, uh, we don't have indication、uh, about the applicability domain. The indication you get is as good as the one you get from the software. So, from a p i s i c prediction, for example, you get the number, but then you need to, to、uh, check the applicability domain as if you were using a p i s i c So, the, the way you think is,、uh, is best. And,、uh, The way the ECA does it、uh, is explained in our、uh, practical guide on、uh, how to use and、uh, report uh, QSARs. Uh, while,、uh, as Yuki just uh, said, uh, when you do a trend analysis or a read across within the toolbox, the toolbox、uh, automatically defines the applicability domain as、uh, the range of、uh, parameters of the analogs used for the prediction. And、uh, together with the results of the profiling. So, the information about the applicability domain is provided in the report、uh, of the toolbox. Now, yes, we see another,、uh, another question. And th、uh, this question is、uh, what is the most important factor which decides the closest、uh, analog, i.e., which factor should be prioritized chemical structure, water solubility? Uh, Locale W or other physical chemical properties. And、uh, I would ask、uh, Alberto Martina Parisio from、uh, ECA to take this question, please, Alberto. Thanks for that. Well,、uh, there are two parts to this question. The, the first one would be that actually it's、uh, pretty much endpoint dependent. So, for instance,、uh, if you are predicting a classical case,、uh, aquatic toxicity, then the local kernel water partition coefficient would be critical to determine how close the analog. If, on the other hand, you're predicting, say, toxicity via inhalation, probably vapor pressure or heavy flow constant would be more relevant. That's on one hand. The other one is that, apart from the properties, what is key is that the closest analog share the functionalities with your target. So that the profiling shows that they are coherent in the same category. In that way, for instance, again, coming back to the case for aquatic toxicity, if you would have analogs which are very close in partition coefficients, But then they show that they are, for instance, protein binding, which would be that they are reactive. When、well, your target is not, then you should disregard those analogs, even if they show that they are close in physical chemical properties of where they are. Okay,、uh, thank you, Alberto. I think、uh, we are going、uh, to address、uh, the question on、uh, UVCBs uh, uh, later. So now we've seen a couple of more questions that do not appear in the top three, but、uh, we see that they got uh, some uh, votes. Uh, one, uh, uh, we can group them.、Uh, one group would be about uh, the um, data in the toolbox, whether、uh, they are、uh, curated、uh, or not. And、uh, about the same topic,、uh, uh, if people or if some users think that there is a mistake in some of the data, what to do about it? And、uh, I will ask、uh, OECD to address this question, please. Okay.、Uh... The OECD did not curate、uh, the data of the QSAT toolbox. The,、uh, QSAT, uh, the data are curated by the donator. And if you find uh, some uh, incorrect data, uh, please uh, inform us by、uh, using, for example,、uh, help desk I show in the last slide. So,、uh, we will contact、uh, each donator to fix it. Okay,、uh, Yuki, thank you very much for that answer. I think、uh, I just want to add one additional、um, general information. We are getting some,、uh, some questions on what will be the, when certain new functionalities will be in, introduced to the toolbox and where is the new toolbox release. So, I would just want to tell you that. New Toolbox version 4.1 will be released in July. 
and the, I will, we will present in our summary of, of the webinar uh, the list of new features which will be implemented. So please, we will please you for a bit of uh, patience and you will see all the new features which are foreseen for version 4.1 at the end of this webinar. Now, uh, colleagues from OECD, could you switch the presenter to ECHA 1, please? Because we'll go to for Doris' presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Doris Schirmann, and in my presentation I want to illustrate how to use the toolbox for different purposes. I've been working for the further development of the QSO toolbox in ECHA for about nine years, and I'm working in the Computational Assessment and Dissemination Unit in ECHA. The QSO toolbox is very versatile. It is divided in six modules, from input to reporting, and you do not necessarily need to use all of them in a predefined order. Depending on what you want to do, you could use only some of them. So in my presentation, I would like to show you how you can use the toolbox for three different purposes. So in the first example, I want to show you how to search for available experimental data for a specific substance. Here I want to cover input, a new feature about a composition information, then how you get access to database information, and there you can find the data reference. In the second example, I want to show you how to use the toolbox to support a meaningful grouping of chemicals. And I'm going to use the query tool for input for that, and I will go through various profiling results and indicate how to export data. In the third example, I want to show you how to check for substances outside a category uh, that you may have in your own portfolio, and to see if the category would still hold. For the example, I'm going to illustrate how a substructure search with the new SMART query tool could work and how you could benefit from uh, the defined endpoint, endpoint functionality. So during my uh, presentation, I will highlight also the new functionalities in the toolbox version 4.0. So now we switch to the live demo, to the uh, QSO toolbox 4.0. And uh, going to my first example, how can the QSO toolbox help me to find available experimental data for my substance? So just to explain, as mentioned before, here I want to cover input, explain uh, this new composition information, how to get access to database information, and where you can find the data reference. Uh, I would like to note that the toolbox contains almost 50 databases, which are maintained in the most up-to-date state. So there is about 80,000 chemicals stored in the toolbox and more than 2 million data points covering physical chemical properties, environmental fate and transport, ecotoxicological and human health endpoints. So in order to search for experimental data, you first have to load the substance in the toolbox. You can use, for example, a CAS number, a name or smiles. So the new version has an improved interface to draw a chemical structure as input for the toolbox, so that you can find here. When the chemical is entered via the structure, the toolbox finds any substance that matches the structure. So in some cases, one structure matches different cast numbers. If I can show you an example with benzene, you will see here 16 chemicals are retrieved. And it's then up to you to decide which cast number would then relate to your question or what is relevant for you. But actually, I want to show you another example by entering a CAS number. So in this case, I would like to use this CAS number I have entered before, 68603872. I click on search, and here I get uh, two matches. So I click OK. It's a decarboxylic acid. and uh, we can use the profiler to see in which databases or inventory the substance appears. So I go to Profiling tab. I close here this first view to have more space for the profiling uh, window. And I select here Database Affiliation and Inventory Affiliation. I click Apply. And here you can see that the first substance 
it comes from the Canadian domestic substance list. And the sec second chemical, it comes from ECACHEM. So if you double click here on the structure, you can see those are different constituents. This you can see here by opening up the node structure info. So here, more information about the substance becomes visible. So what you see here now in this uh, new toolbox version is this composition information. So that means that for each data from ECACAM, you can see if the substance was, for example, a monoconstituent substance or if it is a UVCB. In our example, the substance was registered as a multi-constituent, meaning that the substance consists of more than one major constituent. This is also indicated here with constituents number three, and it would show you also in case it has additives or impurities. Now I have to say here for the impurities, it only shows if the impurities are important for classification and labeling of the substance. So now let's go to the data tab. So if you click on the, in the data matrix, in the endpoint of your interest, let's say you're interested in aquatic toxicity, then all the databases that are relevant for you are marked in green. So you can select now databases that you're interested in, let's say here the Ecodocs databases, and then gather. And then we can say choose, I'm only interested in aquatic toxicity, okay. So it found 19 points for one chemical. Now you can open here the node again, and for example, if you are interested in Daphnia Magnia, 48 hours. If you double click here on the result, you get here to the reference of the data point. It has uh, a number of metadata. And what it does also, it has the link to the website. In this side, uh, example, it is the website of the ECACAM database. So if you click with the right mouse button, you can copy the cell. And then if you go to the web browser, so let's open here a new tab, you enter the site, you come directly to the website of ECHA to get further information about the substance and about uh, the study results. So now back to the user toolbox. I close this view here. So, up. What, you, what is not new, but what is a bit hidden is a direct link to the ECAM portal. So you have to go with the mouse over the CAS number, click again with the right mouse button. Then you find here search, and then you can go directly to the ECAM portal, and it gives you already the site with the uh, test uh, of, of the um, search result with this specific chemical. Now you can get um, general information about the databases by going to the database and then clicking with the right mouse button again and another window opens that says about. So here you have general information about the database, description of endpoints and so on. And at the end of this window, you have another button that's called documentation and it gives a description about the databases in a standardized way in a PDF format. So it gives you also how many substances are mixtures or inorganics, anionic, etc. So that might be quite useful as documentation. So I close this window. Good, so I would like to move now to the next example. I go to input and open a new document. Um, I would like to show you in this example, if you have a group of structurally similar substances, how the user toolbox could support you in the grouping and uh, using it for read across. So I'm going to use the query tool for input go through various profiling results and indicate how to export data. Let's use the category of benzoates. 
So in this case, I would like to show you uh, benzoic acid, sodium benzoate, and benzyl alcohol. I first will select the database. So in this case, I will select only the aquatic oasis database. And I will use the query tool to uh, load uh, these three uh, chemicals with the identifier of the CAS number. So I go back to input, then go to query. Here it asks me, are you sure you want to uh, use these databases in inventories? Yes, I have just selected the one. So in the first tab, you can see already the CAS. So I enter now the chemicals. It's 65850. When it turns black, then it means it's a valid CAS identifier. So the next one is 5532321. Add. And 151.6. Add. So I click here then the Add button. And then you can either click on Execute or double click on here on this icon. And it will search in the database that you have selected or in the inventory the chemicals with these CAS numbers. So opening the structure info node again gives you information about the substance. We go now to the profiling tab. And here, I close first this, a new feature of the toolbox is the color coding of relevant profilers. Let's say you are again interested in aquatic toxicity. So when you click here in the data matrix, it gives you the profilers in a different color code. So if you want to know what the colors mean, there is also a button a bit hidden here. It's called legend. So if you open it, it says green means these are suitable profilers for the endpoint. Orange means plausible profilers. So I will select the ones that are indicated as either plausible or suitable, which are protein binding, and here endpoint specific mechanistic profilers and structural profilers. And then I say apply. And here we go to see the results. A new feature is also that you can now more easily see what is in the cell by just opening up the area. So in case you get more results, don't forget that some elements may be hidden. So if you open up, you can see all the results. So we see here it was identified as uh, benzoids by uh, in the OECD HPV chemical categories. So not, it was saying there it was uh, mainly focusing on human health endpoints and for the environmental endpoints it was not so clear and now you can see also why not. When you look at the uh, endpoint specific profilers, which is aquatic toxicity classification by VRH, I open here that you can see the full name, then uh, ac acute aquatic toxicity mode of action by OASIS and acute toxicity classification by ECOSA, you see that for this one has an acid functionality, this one has a alcohol functionality, and it's picked up also by the profilers that you get a different results. So this is basically the salt of the acid, of the free acid. So what we can see furthermore is protein binding alerts. That would give you an indication of excess toxicity, so more toxicity than what you could expect based on the log KOW information. So there is other alerts that may help you to check if your category is robust or not. And I would like to highlight here two. The one is hydrolysis information that would give you information about the stability of uh, your target substance in the test system compared to a substance where you have data and you would like to do the read across. So you want to make sure that they behave in a similar way. And also ionization may be in some cases important to compare for your read across. So if you begin to apply, 
it will give you these additional profiling results. So what was expected here, hydrolysis doesn't give alerts because there is also no functionality that could be hydrolyzable. For ionization, you see the difference. The, it shows you that the acid is dissociated at uh, pH of 9, but here at uh, low pH it would be in its neutral form, while the alcohol doesn't dissociate. So that may be quite interesting information. Uh, for example, if you plan to use a weight of evidence approach and you want to use QSAS, you may consider to use uh, LOCK-D in some cases. So furthermore, you can extract the data that may support you in your uh, justification of the hypothesis. So you would go to gather data. You could uh, gather data on all endpoints. And this information could be then as a data matrix, it can uh, help you to support your grouping. So especially you will look at uh, endpoints that are related to the endpoint that you would like to predict. Then uh, I think there was also a question in the Slido about uh, how to export. So it is possible to export all this data by going here on the left side and then click the right mouse button again. And then you can see here a button appearing that says export data matrix. Here you can select the information that you are interested in, or all of them, uh, 2D parameters, uh, physical chemical properties, environmental fate and transport, ecotox, human health, and also your profiling information. So the export format is uh, a CSV file or a text file. Uh, it, it's maybe not, it, it, it exports all the information, but it's maybe not in, a, in the best possible format yet. So what we plan in the next version, in the version 4.0, uh, 4.1, plan to be released in summer, that the format of this output file would look like the data matrix that you can now export from the reporting tab. So my colleague uh, Alberto will show you in his presentation more about how this uh, data matrix looks like. We saw from this slide, poll that there was also quite some interest about the import-export functionality. So today, unfortunately, we do not have time to show all these functionalities, but I would like to refer at this uh, point to the tutorials at the Accuser Toolbox website, which uh, guide you through the functionalities. So there is also an improved functionality now for importing databases. With this example, I wanted to illustrate that structural similarity is normally not enough to justify a meaningful category. So information about mechanistic similarity, stability in the test system, uptake potential, and data from related endpoints, if there are any, are meant to support you in deciding whether read across or trend analysis is meaningful. Now I would like to go to my third example. I again open a new document. So let's assume you have already uh, made a category from chemicals of your own portfolio. But what we recommend is that you check whether there is uh, substances outside of this category with data and to verify whether your uh, hypothesis still holds or whether this other data would indicate that it doesn't fit together anymore. So let's assume you have a category of similar substances in your portfolio that you want to use for read across. And I would like to show you now a way to search within the toolbox databases for substances with a similar structure, which you then can compare with your own set of substances and see if there are data that you should take into account for the read across. There are different ways how you could do search for chemicals. You can follow the predefined workflow, as we have seen in the previous uh, presentation. Or you can, uh, if you have a more complicated um, chemistry and you know exactly what you are looking for, you could also use the new SMARTS query tool. It is meant to illustrate 
you the capability of this functionality. So it's a, maybe a bit more complicated. It's an advanced functionality. And if you like to use it, I recommend to see the tutorials where different examples are given on how to use the smart query. I, the smart query you can find here in the input tab. But before, actually, I should uh, select the, all the databases, because if you want to see if there any, is any data available, you should, of course, click on all the databases. So I go back to input, click on substructure smart. So let's uh, imagine you have a target chemical that is an aliphatic primary amine and has a rather long alkyl chain and your endpoint of interest is short-term fish toxicity. So because you want to get the maximum amount of similar substances, as I said before, you check all relevant databases. So what I'm going to do now, I use one of these features that is listed here. It's this X-host fragment. So I click here in the middle. Then I use the selection tool. I add here for the amine group, here I change the C to N. Here I can access the settings for this. I want to be the primary amine, so I define two H atoms. Okay. So when you click here, you can define also how often this structure should appear in your uh, substance. So we we say we want to have it only once, so you can define here once, click on save. Then you go back to the exhaust fragment. And then you can set also restrictions for the total length. So I click here. I can say, for example, I want to see only substances that are uh, having a total count of 10 to, let's say, upper limit of 30. Don't forget to save, otherwise it's not taken into account. And then I press OK. And the toolbox is now searching all the databases that fits the set parameters. So it found here 18 substances. Okay. So what I would like to show you is another functionality uh, that is called define target endpoint. But first, I want to show you how it looks if you don't use this. So I gather all the data for aquatic toxicity. Okay. Oh, I think it's still loading. Okay. Yeah, I think it's still loading this amount of chemicals. So maybe I show you immediately then the functionality of the if, uh, here it's coming now. So I just wanted to show you that because of how the data is reported in different databases, also because of ECACAM, the there's a lot of information and uh, it's a bit scattered. So if you get this data matrix, it may be a bit difficult to find your way through the ones that are, you are interested in. So there's a new functionality that is called target endpoint. And I would like to show you how this works. So we say we are interested in aquatic toxicity. I press here next. I click here on the endpoint and I'm interested in LC50. And then maybe you want to define also another parameter, let's say the duration. So you add it here. And then when you hover the mouse over, it tells you how the format should be. In this case, 96 hours. That is exactly what we are also using, 96 hours. Then you say finish. 
So in a few moments, it should show you how it looks like. Here in this row that is marked yellow, you see all the information that fits this LC50 and the uh, duration of the test of 96 hours. So if you double click here, you can then go through the data and check whether you missed any important data point or whether your category built with your uh, chemicals will hold already. So this is what I wanted to show you regarding this functionality of these new substructure smarts querying tool. And uh, because the slider poll was, um, um, or you, you voted in the slider poll the, as a bonus topic, uh, more information about uh, querying, data querying. I will show you now another example about uh, querying data. So I open another document. Here I will um, select only one database just to make it a bit easier to illustrate. I will select here Aquatic Oasis and I go again to input and I open the query tool. It gives me again the warning if I'm aware that it's only uh, looking for the in the database that I've selected. Yes. So let's say you are interested in um, chemicals that have an LC50 value below one milligram per liter and you want to link this also with another query about the PCF. Let's say you're interested in only the chemicals that have a PCF value above 2000. And uh, then we can uh, link it even then with a substructure search. So first I go to data. I select the endpoint, LC50. Then you have to scroll down, select here in data mass concentration. You want to give it in milligram per liter, and then you select here smaller than and one. So you add it here to the right pane by clicking on add. And we can already now search for it, or we can link it immediately, and then I show you the output. So I go here to the parameters, where you can find the parameter for calculating or predicting BCF. Here it is uh, in a log unit, so if I enter bigger than 2,000, I have to do it in the form of 3.2. It's the logarithmic bioaccumulation. And I add this here on the right side. So in order to link these two querying, um, uh, these two search, you activate with the right mouse button this icons and then these become available and you can link them with and. Then either you will click here on execute or you can double click directly here on end and it will retrieve all the chemicals that have a LC50 below one milligram and a BCF above 2000. So you can see here, still processing. And it found 35 chemicals. What you can see here, most of these chemicals seem to have a benzene ring. Maybe you're interested in chemicals that don't have a benzene ring, just to illustrate you the functionality. So you can link it further with a subfragment search. You go here to add, you use this template for benzene ring. OK, you add again this query, you activate again with the right mouse button click. And because you want to see the chemicals that don't have this subfragment, you click here on not. And then you link it with these other queries with the end. And you double click again here. And now it will give you all the chemicals in the database selected 
predicted have a LC50 below 1 milligram per liter, have a BCF predicted above 2000, and don't have any benzene ring. So you can see here, we can also check these two D parameters here. So BCF, so you can calculate calculate the BCF for all chemicals. Indeed, here it's above 3.3, and you can also check the LC50. So I would need to gather the data for aquatic toxicity. And you see here, so we don't know yet whether it's the LC50 values, but I suppose so. So you have various values here all below one milligram per liter, for example, this one. Good, this was just to illustrate you the functionality. Of course, you can uh, think of more meaningful searches. Um, those were the three examples or use cases I wanted to show you today. Um, we are going to have now a 10 minutes break, but before Andrea indicates that uh, I'll pass on the mic to him. So thank you for watching this webinar. Okay, Doris, thank you very much for showing these examples. Uh, I, okay, just something that popped up with the, the, the question. Some people are asking whether the webinar will be recorded uh, and made available. Uh, as far as I know, OACD is recording uh, the webinar. Uh, therefore, uh, it will be made available uh, at some point on the OACD uh, website. And uh, now we will have this uh, 10 minutes break. Please also use this time uh, to check questions on uh, Slido, because after the break we are going uh, first to show some uh, some other examples with Alberto, but then we are going to have a, uh, around a half an hour discussion on the most uh, hot topic. Uh, so please uh, use uh, this uh, the tool. Uh, thank you, and see you in ten minutes after the break. Uh, where my colleague Doris left it and showing you some uh, extra functionalities of the QSER toolbox, some a bit advanced, some of them new. Now, what I intend uh, to show you will be uh, three main things. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the metabolism functionalities in the toolbox, explain the difference between the observed and predicted uh, information in there, so how it is displayed in metabolic trees when available, and explain a bit of a case on how the profiling of the metabolites can help to check if a read across is consistent. And then, because it was one of the questions most voted in our Slido poll, I'm going to spend uh, some time explaining you about the new quantitative information on metabolites that has been included in the version 4.0. After that, I will uh, explain a bit about the different gap filling techniques, which are the difference and when we recommend each. And again, so a bit of new stuff in the toolbox. And the final part will be about the new reporting. Now we have a new report design. Uh, it has been uh, totally revamped. It looks uh, way clearer than before. And on top of that, when a prediction has been generated with the toolbox, we will have a new data matrix functionality, which is, uh, well, it will be implemented in the future without necessity of doing a prediction, but so far it really helps a lot when uh, you want to document your read across in a transparent manner or your tenant analysis, whatever. Now, if we go live to the toolbox, this one has left it, and then <coughs> I'm going to start with a new document. So. <coughs> For the purpose of this example, I'm going to upload uh, some substances. Doris already showed you how to do it in different ways. I'm going to show you yet another one, which is how to upload a list of smiles. Now, if we go to my sample file, sorry, 
here we are. Okay, so here we have a list generated with Notepad, and as you can see, it's uh, in determination is dot SMI for smiles, and then here I just enter manually the smiles for two different chemicals. So in this very simple way, I can upload a whole list of structures, as you can see. It's been successfully imported. <clears throat> now, uh, you will see that here I don't have CAS or uh, identifiers. This is because in the interfi input file I only added the structures, not the CAS information or the name, but for the purpose of this exercise it is enough. So we close it, move to profiling, and here I can show you where to find uh, the metabolization functionalities. There are actually two different places. The first one is slightly more hidden. If you are here to your document and right click, you will see below at this menu the option multiplication. And here you can find all the different metabolic options that the toolbox includes. Now, a bit of a more obvious place, it's placed here under the profiling methods. You have here this tab, metabolism transformations where you can pick the option you wish. And they are grouped into different groups. So you have the documented metabolism. Now, uh, if you get uh, some heat for a molecule with uh, this uh, profiling scheme for metabolism, there is actually experimental metabolism. It has a reference. It's been observed in an, in an experimental test. So you can actually refer to the original uh, source and it's, of course, much more reliable than the second option, which is the simulated version. All of the profiler listed here are just predictions. They are simulated, so they need to be taken with more care than the ones documented here. But you have more options. And then, which one to choose? As already showed you, the toolbox has some this really useful functionality that now it highlights what is relevant for your endpoint. So, if, say, you were going to predict synthesization accounting for metabolism, when you click here, the toolbox highlights that these simulators can be relevant for your case. Now, uh, one particularity about the metabolism simulators is that when you include metabolization in your profiling, all the profiling methods selected here are applied to all the metabolisms generated by the toolbox. Therefore, uh, it is a uh, good advice the, not to include randomly many metabolism simulators because if you combine many metabolism profilers with many category profilers, the computation time is going to increase exponentially. So when you are using metabolism, try to take as less as possible in general. Now, I'm going to show you a bit more about uh, how this works. Let's say uh, that I'm interested in for instance, these two. And so, same one for observed and simulated. When I press apply, I will get here the metabolites that are predicted for my substance. Note that uh, for the observed, for this uh, substance, the number is zero, which means that there is no experimental pathway documented in the toolbox for this. Now, how we can see the metabolites that have been predicted? Well, very simply, we can double click here and they will appear automatically displayed. You can see them one by one. You can increase the size by double clicking, but then you can also save to a smart files and import it in another tool. Now, uh, the thing with the metabolism simulator is that it will show you predicted metabolites, but it doesn't show in which order they are formed. That you need to guess yourself, you need to put them somewhere else, you need to do a bit of a work to try to display it in an next pathway. However, if you have, like in this case, metabolites that come from an observed profiler, you can also get this view where they are displayed, but which is way nicer. If you double click, right click here, you get this option and then you show the metabolic map. And here you can see, again, you can double click to make the molecules bigger, but what is very nice is that you have them here put in the right order where they will appear. So you can use the panning and zooming functionalities to travel through the pathway and see what's going to come. 
And again, if you need to track back the original reference, you will have it here. But on top of that, you have here the information on the experiment in general, the conditions, the fit say in vivo, in vitro, etc., etc. Now, how this can use a bit uh, to our read across? Well, let's just say that I'm interested in, say, uh, using read across between these two molecules for, say, higher tier human endpoints. So let's take two profiles that are relevant, and I'm only going to tick because, like I say, I don't want the computation time to increase dramatically. And this is a profiler for casinoinicity, and DART refers to developmental and reproductive toxicity endpoints. So they would be relevant for human health endpoints. Now, when I press apply, the toolbox is going to warn me what I told you. The profilers are going to be applied on all metabolites. So if you have lots of molecules, if you have a lot of metabolites, it's going to take long. Now, I wish to continue. Press yes. And OK. Let's see how the profile looks. Now, in principle, one would see that the profilers for these two molecules seem kind of coherent. No other found, no not present. That's good enough. They seem coherent in principle. Let's see what would happen if we take the metabolism into account. You can see that each of these uh, metabolism methods will have below all the profilers. Now, the way it is displayed, here, it will tell you of these 15 metabolites which then have been categorized in each class. For instance, if we look at this carcinoid example, we would see here we have from these 15 metabolites, well, 14 have been found no alert, but one of them has this alert for a haldehyde, which actually is common to this one. Now we can say, okay, this shows that with metabolism, this is uh, coherent, but if we double click, we will see what we have below. Then we see the guilty chemical for this alert is this one that we can display with a right click, this simple aldehyde. And we will conclude, OK, this is coherent by the same point. But because we have observed metabolism, we can see that actually here in the experimental value, there is no alert found for any of the 17 metabolites. So this simple aldehyde given raised to an alert was not found it was not given the alert so in fact they seem similar by using this predicted metabolism this predicted metabolism but for the looking at the cell we could see that mm, actually the category maybe is, the drug cross is not so coherent if we look at the other endpoint what we could see again here the predicted Metabolism in this case says that there is nothing of concern, so 15 metabolites predicted, 15 metabolites that are giving no alert when you double click. But then if we look at the other, ah, we see there is a different from the five metabolites, at least one of them has been found to give rise to some concern according to this scheme. This is highlighted in red. We double click. And again, we could display here what is wrong with right click. And then we will see that this is the chemical given rest of concern. Does this invalidate automatically your read across? Well, no. But the point is, if you still would insist that read across is a good idea between these two molecules, despite this inconsistency, you should try to focus in showing that this chemical highlighted here in red that gives rise to the concern that actually not happen, that the prediction was not okay for whatever reason you have to prove that that's the case. And that's a bit uh, the generic part I wanted to touch on metabolism. Now, <clears throat> going a bit more into the new functionalities, uh, because it was the bonus topic requested metabolism, one of them, I'm going to show you some uh, new function from this version, which is related to metabolism, which is quite interesting, which is the inclusion of quantitative uh, information from the metabolism. I just imported another file. And in this case, by the way, you can appreciate that, in fact, I do have not only the static in the previous case, but the CAS and the chemical name. And that is because in this input file, I not only included the structure like before, but it's in the format 
cache, tab, name, tab, smiles. So if you follow this format, when you enter a series of structures, you will be able to display the structure, the cache, and the name. Good. So that was for the input. What do we have here? Series of molecules, and I'm going to go to this new profiler. I'm going to untick everything here just to make things a bit smoother. And select, and this is the new profiler of cerebral metabolism with quantitative data, which includes really useful information for your supporting of categories through the cross. Now, when we apply it, and we go to profile, what we will see. Metabolites, like before, no surprise. Double click, metabolite displays, good. But if we right click and go to this option, so metabolic math, as we did before, we see that now there is a slight difference in the metabolic math display, which is that for most of the structures, not all of them, but for most, there is this uh, symbol in green, UKY, which stands for quantity, which means that for those structures, when we expand here, we also have the quantitative metabolites as function as time. So we have an estimation of after the time, how much percent of the molecules was left. And we have it for this one. You can see we have it for this one. We have it for many. And this can really help or destroy, as the case may be, your category and your read across, because it not only so if the chemical, if, if, if a parent chemical may be of more or less toxicology concern than a metabolite, but you, it allows you to consider where it's going to be created fast enough or not. So if you would decide, for instance, that this is your chemical of concern, if for some reason this would give higher concern than the parent, but then you would see from the function of time that it disappears really quickly, perhaps it's not so important, or vice versa, if this is created really quickly and then stays there, the quantity increases not only the function of time, it really where you should maybe focus your read across argumentation. This is uh, one really nice functionality, and the other one related to this is that actually there is a observed half-life in mammal calculated based on these trees, and you can use it as you would do for some other descriptors in the QSR toolbox during the data gap filling. Allow me to show you this with a bit of a more practical example. Now let's go to data and select, and because uh, this is a uh, for mammals, let's go to a human health endpoint. So let's say I'm interested in predicting acute oral toxicity. I think one database that contains information from this endpoint. Gather the data. Well, in this case, it's on the database is only for acute oral toxicity, but you can also select here. If you have more databases selected, what's your endpoint of interest? Okay. Off we go. We have information for our chemicals. When we click here, we can expand to see what we have, and it would appear that indeed I can try to predict for this target substance my LD50 in rat, assuming that my category would be coherent in this case, we didn't pay much attention for it. But for the purpose of this example, let's say that we want to predict the acute city for but uh, I would click here, wait for my information to appear, which may take a little while. And then we can move to data gap filling. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we are. Now let's assume I'm going to try to use a read across for filling it. Okay, I'm fine with this scale. <clears throat> Waiting. You can see it's still working, the progress bar is moving. There we are. This is the usual plot for a data gap uh, filling. I will talk about uh, this a bit more in depth later on. But at this point, by default, the prediction is done with the local tunnel water partition coefficient. And we are talking about metabolism here. So like I said, you can use it uh, this uh, inf met quantitative metabolic information as a descriptor. If available, it's not there for molecules, but if it's there, it can be useful. So let's say that you think that uh, how fast the molecule disappears in uh, the mammal is relevant, more relevant than the local W. 
you could use it as your descriptor to evaluate how close the molecules are during the data gap filling. You go to descriptors, find the right parameter here, so uh, half life of cell metabolism. Double click to make it a descriptor. Double click to remove the previous one. Now we are going to make the prediction based on the observed half life. When I click to prediction, you will see that the plot has changed, and now the prediction is considering the closest analogs based on the half life observed. So 40 minutes, this in case minutes. Well, the prediction is not very good, but you could say it's relevant. Now, that's one way of using this new information. The other one would be that you could use it to filter out some data, thinking that, well, okay, perhaps things that disappear very fast are not going to be very relevant for my case. So how we do that? We we'll go to select filter data, and then click the option, mark chemicals with a filter value. And like I said, this quantitative metabolic information is now uh, a normal descriptor, so you can find it in this list. Half-life of cell metabolism. And when you take it, you could say that, well, you know, let's say that, I don't know, I don't want to see anything that uh, disappears in less than eight minutes, for instance. So when I press OK, it will flag those data points. And we can say, that, OK, I think these are not relevant from a read across, so I have them highlighted and I can choose to remove them. They will be removed and the reader clause recalculated with the molecules I have left. Now, this is uh, well, this is how you can show and use this new quantitative metabolic information. And well, it can come handy at many points, even if it's uh, finding observed metabolization, it's complicated because there is not so much experimental data available. But it's a good tip to try to find them if it's there because really it can help your case. That was everything for the metabolism. And now for the next example, like I said, I wanted to talk a bit more about the difference between the different data gap filling techniques. So let's create a new document. And as usual, let's import yet another list. Now, this list is in yet another format where you can import your substances. So if you look at it, it I'm just entering here the cast number when I have it, and the smiles. The trick in this case is that the format is cast number, two tabs, and smiles. And that is because the normal format for input in the toolbox is in the way cast, tab, name, tab, smiles. So you don't have a name, but only a cast and a smiles. Just put the cast, two tabs, the smiles, and in this way, as you can see, the import will work. I take my file. Seven extractors, and if I have done things correctly, there you are. I should have extractors, I should have the cache, and in that case, because there was a cache, the toolbox was able to look in the database and find available names for those substances. So we are already better than before. <clears throat> now, this uh, case, the file was called Skin Sense for Skin Civilization, obviously, because the first case I'm going to talk is read across. So, read across is an advisable technique, mostly in two situations when your endpoint of interest is of qualitative nature. That means that it's expressed in the form positive, negative, yes, no. So for sensitization, you can express it as yes sensitizer, no sensitizer, for instance. And the second situation would be when you don't have a lot of analogs. So maybe you have a qualitative endpoint, you would in theory be able to find a mathematical trend, but simply you only have two, three analogs, you can make a calculation you would then resort to it across. But the typical case, like I said, is a qualitative endpoint. So for this case, I've uploaded this list of substance, presumably analogs. I will go to data and then minimize this. Now we can see anything and we can find a database in today's test. We can use this filter functionality in the profilers, by the way. So if I put here skin, I would choose skinization. They just take one to make things faster and then gather all the endpoints. We can again choose sensitization. It doesn't matter at this point because the only database I speak is from sensitization, but still, okay. I get my data. I can see 
how I have data for some substances, but not for this one, which will be my target. In this case, for the guinea pig maximization test, which, as you can see, the matrix is expressed in the form positive negative. So, quality item point. <clears throat> in the data filling, I would then choose read across. I can select what is the scale I wish for the data gap filling. If you, by the way, if you hover over it, you will see what's the difference between different scales. For that case, let's just take this one. It's more simple. Okay. We are waiting, and now we see the same chart we see before for the data gap filling. So this is the cross, as you can see, no calculation, no mathematical trend, just it's in the same positive, negative. And that is that. You can uh, calculate that positive, negative in different options that you can toggle here, prediction approach, calculation, click prediction approach, and then you can see you want to use the highest mode, you want to use the maximal, you want to use the median of the cases, you could use five neighbors by default, or you could use three if you're more comfortable with less chemicals or less mode, you can toggle that. But again, the bottom line is like not many analogs, qualitative endpoint, go for it across is your best choice. Now, another case, let's show where I would go for a trend analysis. Get another list of substances you can see here. Here we have, and then let's say that in this case, I'm interested in a qualitative endpoint, and let's assume that they have a fair amount of data points, or at least some that I could see a trend if there is one. Classical example, like I said, aquatic uh, acute aquatic toxicity. So let's go to the database, and we could highlight uh, at the input in the data matrix, for instance, as well, just to do it differently. Here we see the ones that are for ecotoxicological. Let's just pick one, ecotox, and gather the endpoints. I'm interested in aquatic tox. Good. There we are. It would appear that I have quite some data for my category, except for my target, which is good. So when I enter in data gap filling, I will press trend analysis and, okay, there's an inconsistency. I'm going to ignore it at uh, this point. No, hang on. This makes things more complicated. Allow me to go back on that. Let's cancel this. Let's be a bit more accurate. So we can use the filter functionality maybe and just go to my. Uh, yes. We click and press enter, goes actually to Office of Interest. OK. Let's do it at this level. It will make the data matrix easier to see. Again, this is the input I'm going to predict with my trend. You could see how I could cancel an operation ongoing, by the way, when you make a mistake, which is useful because there are lots of clicks, so that's uh, an additional learning. Trend analysis, now with less, hopefully, problems in the general data. Okay, perfect. I'm not going to cancel this time because I suspect this looks fine. Maybe even too good to be true, but there you are. You can clearly see a mathematical trend, and in this case, the toolbox will give you a prediction based on a linear regression, you will have the equation, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> uh, so you can calculate qualitative, you can calculate potency, it's not in the form positive, negative. Another thing is that uh, if you had less analogs, you could also go to a read across for whatever reason, or if you feel your trend is not good enough. And in that case, you can change your mind in the last minute, go to the feeling approach, press read across, and then this will window just simply by taking into account the closest analogs. And again, like I said before, you can do calculation options and change the data uses. Let's use the mean, the average, use less analogs more, whatever. So that's another option you could do. And the last one, let's say you cannot find a trend. You don't have good analogs. You just have hope that you can make some data gap filling with the toolbox. That's when. Let's delete this to get the full data matrix again. Good. So, <clears throat> would you have good analogs? I'm not going to enter another list, by the way. 
you have enough of that probably. You can go to data gap filling and go to QSERS. Now, the thing with uh, QSERS, you can see as you navigate the tree, if they are there or not. So you can see the number changing. If you click here, you see that you have 678 QSERS on nodes below. Here, you have 37 QSERS relevant for environmental freight and transport. And if you go more specifically to your endpoint of interest, it will be highlighted in green. But in fact, at this position, you have 13 users relevant for this endpoint. Even more, you can select uh, to see only the ones that are chemical relevant. So in some cases, if a QSAR model has been developed only for, say, aromatic amines, and you have your chemical is an aromatic amine, it will be so. And if it's not, the QSAR will not be shown. But so far, OK, I want to predict the accumulation with a QSAR for my substance. I press QSAR on the right box. What do I see? Takes it away. There you are. You can see all the available QSAR for this endpoint. In this case, by concentration, you can see the names, the prediction we generated. You can see some information on the endpoint, the class, the fees. You can see also some new information on the QSAR if available, the R square, the standard deviation, and so on. And if it's available, which is the case for some, but not all of them at the moment from the toolbox, you can see the test and the training set, and that's useful when you want to assess the reliability of your prediction, of course. And by clicking, right clicking on the model of your interest, you can show, in this case, the test set which is available. We click. We see the test set that was used for this particular user model together with experimental data behind. And you can save it, by the way, to a Smiles file that will probably allow you to assess your prediction later on. Now, I'm interested in this model. It's good for my endpoint. So I can see a training set. I press OK. I get three possibilities. Enter gap filling, which takes me to the same uh, screen you have seen before for the gap filling. I'm not going to go into that. You can predict the selected chemical or all chemicals. And it's quite obvious at this point what they do. If I just press predict selected chemical and OK, I just get the prediction for the chemical I have highlighted. If I would, let's take another QSAR. Say, here we see that we have QSARs below. Screening test, there is something. By the way, the gravity. So, again, I have this QSAR model. I press OK. In this case, I press predict all chemicals. Ba -ba -ba -ba. There you see, prediction generators for all of them. And by the way, because it's a QSAR, you would see that in front of each value, you have a Q. Run. As opposed to experimental data, where you have M for measure. Good. So this is how you can use a QSAR. Uh, take into account, by the way, that uh, the reason why you have all this information available here and on the right click of the QSAR and so on is so that you can afterwards assess the reliability of your predictions. So you will get no automatic assessment of how good the predictions are. That's on you. But you can generate them quite easily for many of the endpoints. And you know, you have a fair amount of uh, QSARs, I believe. Uh, if we just and take this to see how many QSERs we have, we have 741 QSERs embedded in the toolbox, many of them coming from EpiSuite, some from other sources, but there is quite something inside. OK, that was enough for the gap filling techniques. And now I wanted to show you something about the reporting functionalities and the data matrix. Uh, for that, I made a small trick because this functionality I want to show, it's available when you have done a prediction. So. I take in the liberty of making in advance a prediction for this molecule using another new functionality of the toolbox, which is the automated workflow. This is really nice. If you would use this gap finish functionality, when you press click, you would just select your endpoint, press OK, select again, more specific, OK. This is just a warning about the selected endpoint. Doris talked before about how to select in the beginning uh, a particular endpoint for a prediction. This case is fine. And then the toolbox will start automatically to do all this prediction workflow. It will gather all the profilers that are relevant for that endpoint. It will get the data from the relevant databases. It will define a category. And in the data filling, it will make subcategorize little by little until it gets a regression or a data cross that is good enough. But it will do so taking time, and we don't have that much time left. So. I'm going to stop it, yes, and I'm going to show you what would be the outcome of this directly. 
we get out of this window. Oops, yes, functionalities, that's where we are. We have our prediction here. And our prediction comes with a really, really nice report. We come here, we select this prediction, and we create the report. Now, when we do this, uh, this probably makes more sense after you have seen the report. This is how you can customize your report. So you can add your profilers, it is on the analogs, etc., etc. But it probably makes more sense that we just create a default report and then show you. So I just press here, create report. It's thinking, as you can see. Okay, and I get two pieces of information: the report and the data matrix. Now the report, those of you familiar with the toolbox will notice that now it's clearer. It's uh, a bit less crowded. It's uh, probably more useful than ever, or that was our intention. So you can see your target of interest by default, a brief summary of the prediction, which value we have predicted, which trend we use, etc., etc. A picture of the plot you use to create this prediction, and all the information you need, the algorithm, the statistics of the prediction. As you scroll down, some information on the uncertainty of the prediction, statistical, you can see the profilers, and then you can see that this has been used to the primary grouping, and then all these other relevant profilers for some categorization later on. How the analogs were selected, and here you can check as well that the target chemical is in the right domain of the analogs use. With, by the way, if it was not the case, the automated workflow would have stopped and not generated a prediction. And if you scroll down, more information of all the categories and so on and so forth. And here you can even see which part am I? Hang on a second. Yes, the pruning. So at some point, some of the data points have been eliminated. And what is the reason? Here you have which data points were eliminated, and you have why. Because this, the experimental water solubility in this case was smaller than the effect value. So, of course, you should not trust those points. This is everything quite clear, and by the way, the fact that it's been generated automatically by the toolbox doesn't mean that it's automatically accepted. The reason you have this report is that you can assess it yourself and verify that's the case. But here you're missing one important piece of information, which is the analogs, which comes, if we go back to the toolbox, to the other new option, which is the data matrix. So as we press open, you will see this new version, which is what we will implement in the future without the need to do a prediction. And here, you can see the structures, you can see the identifiers, the profile is used for the categorization, and all the data that you have used to generate the prediction together with the references for full transparency. So this can help you assess how good is your trend or build better your read across or come back and redo manually if you have done automatically something. We believe it's very really helpful. And again, it's quite customizable. So if we close it, and we go back to this option, we could think, uh, well, you could eliminate some sections of the report if you want a summarized version, or you could change different things. You could change the profiles that has shown if you are missing some profiler that you would like to see for some reason. Uh, a very interesting option for the analogs in the data matrix, you could choose to include the 2D parameters or the profilers. So for instance, we are predicting aquatic toxicity. What is relevant for that? Well, obviously, the descriptor we use for the prediction, which in this case was the low octanol water partition coefficient. Water solubility would be interesting to know as well. Again, you can put it from several sources if you want to. And then maybe, I don't know, you want to see if it's uh, volatile, vapor pressure. You could uh, want to select uh, what is the predicted BCF and so on. <laughs> and if you create the report now, you would use this for two instances, go to the data matrix, and when you open, you will see the difference. Now here, on top of all that you had before, you have all these parameters that can be really, really useful to assess your prediction or your category. <clears throat> and I'm thinking out of time. And I'm going to stop at uh, this uh, point, and I'm going to pass uh, the floor to my colleague, Doris.
Yes, hello. Before OECD passes the, the screen on to Andrea for the further discussion, I wanted to use the opportunity to show one more functionality in the live demo that was uh, requested. And the question was about the set tree hierarchy. So I'm using this opportunity to show up, I think. So here we go. Okay, so I would like to go back to one of the earlier documents where we had a number of uh, data and would like to show you how you could use the set tree hierarchy functionality in combination with the filter endpoint tree that can become quite handy. Okay, so I think now I'm also, you can also see what I can see, so the, the screen is now shared. Uh, so I, I went here to another uh, a previous uh, document that has some data. So let's say you are interested again in fish with a specific uh, duration. You can here open, but you start here with a lot of different uh, fish types, so it's a bit different to see all the data in one place. So what you can do here is, for example, to filter according to the fish. And then what you can also do here is to use the set tree hierarchy functionality. So because we filter it according to test organism to the fish, so I can move this further down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I want to continue. So I would like to move this further down. And uh, you start with the parameter that uh, you know you would like to look at. For example, you are interested only in duration 96 hours. So that would come on top. And for example, you know that you would like to look only at mort uh, mortality. So you could uh, have this effect as a second. So let's say OK. So you can see here now it starts differently and you can click here the duration first, mortality second. So you would have all the rest combined in one line that would be now otherwise scattered around. So this is about what I wanted to show you. And I would like to ask now OECD to share the desk back to uh, Andrea for the further discussion to ECHA2. Thank you, Alberto and Doris, uh, for your uh, presentation. So now what uh, we are going to do is uh, to have uh, to use the last half an hour for um, uh, discussing uh, the uh, most uh, uh, hot questions. And uh, uh, we can start uh, with uh, um, the, the question on uh, uh, the second one we can read here. Are there any limits for the read across prediction results where risk assessor should not accept it? And here I would ask OACD if they want to answer this question. Thanks, Andrea. So I'll give some uh, observations to this question. So I think more generally, read across uh, is a tool in the suite of approaches that are available to a risk assessor. So really, the, the decision about whether to accept the prediction or not depends a lot on the context that you're using um, this prediction in. So are you using it for screening chemicals or looking for flags? Are you using it in a risk assessment uh, to fill a data requirement? So all of these would have different levels of uh, confidence that you would need in, in your prediction. And also, there would be different legislative um, constructs as well, which you know, may or may not, that you may or may not be able to use a, a read across prediction in. So these are all, I think, factors that, that influence that. And then throughout the webinar today, you heard uh, in the examples that Alberto and, uh, and Doris provided, and, and I think they spoke to this many times in their presentations about the different types of uh, information or factors that might affect your confidence in, in your prediction. 
um, the different types of information, such as you know, looking at information on um, other endpoints or on other properties, um, looking at uh, information for your chemical, and then the, taking a close look at your analogs as well, and making a, a good justification as to your confidence in, in your read across. And uh, Yuki and Tomas spoke earlier too about the applicability uh, domain information and the different types of information that's available to to help you decide if, if your prediction was, was good or not. So I think um, you know, all these factors come into play in answering this question. And as well, there's the, the, the question always in the regulatory context about transparency uh, in a prediction. And with the QSAR toolbox, one of the advantages, of course, as you saw the report at the end, uh, is that it can be very transparent in how you went about making your prediction and what information uh, was used uh, in order to make the, the read across prediction. Um, but it, also in the end, uh, it really uh, is uh, your, your prediction, and you need to have enough confidence uh, in that prediction for your particular use, and, and also to integrate this with the other information that you have to make a decision about its utility. Okay, uh, thank you, Eva. Before asking uh, another question uh, to you, I just want to point out that uh, concerning the ECA perspective, uh, uh, whether uh, a read across is accepted or not, uh, uh, there is uh, the document uh, read across assessment uh, framework uh, published on uh, ECA website, and uh, uh, it doesn't matter for us if the uh, read across comes from the QSR toolbox or come from other tools or come from someone who has done the work on paper. Uh, we always assess the read across versus the requirement that we wrote uh, in our uh, uh, document. So this is the the ECA point of view. Um, okay, so the, another question maybe for OECD is that okay, people are appreciating the functionalities for the standardized and automated uh, workflow, and they were wondering uh, if uh, it's uh, in the plan for the future to de develop uh, it for more endpoints. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we're really uh, quite excited about in this new version is the availability of the automated workflow and the standardized workflow. And we hope this provides also an, an access point uh, into the toolbox for new users so they get uh, more comfortable with the functionalities and, and what uh, the toolbox can do for you. Um, and we really, really look uh, to feedback um, on, on, um, on the schemes uh, the, the workflows for both the aquatic talks and the skin sensitization. Uh, so feedback from the from people using them about the positive and negatives uh, uh, about the functionalities. Uh, indeed, these are two of the more straightforward uh, endpoints, and uh, we haven't decided uh, which endpoints we would, uh, would would do next. But uh, are really using this new version as as an opportunity now to to pilot these workflows and get feedback. Um, on their utility to the various user communities. So we're happy to get that uh, feedback as people explore the functionality. Uh, thank you, Eva. Let's, let's move on to the ne next question. And I think the next question is uh, Alberto from ECA is going to answer it. And it's about uh, UVCBs. Can I use the QSR toolbox for UVCBs? How would that work in uh, practice? Alberto, please. Thank you, Andrea. Well, uh, the problem in for this case is that the QSAR toolbox is largely based on structures. So, if for a new EDCB you cannot defend structures, then of course you have a very difficult case. On the other hand, if for UVCBs you know where your constituents, you are able to define a set of structures, even a large one, then you can you will be able to use the toolbox at least partially. So you will be able to get information on some of the structures, you could use the profiling on them, you may find information on some of the constituents. If you want to go as far as to generate a prediction for it, you could be able to identify which is the worst case scenario for an endpoint and for one of the constituents on that substance, and they take one for the whole substance. Or if you know that all the constituents have your same mode of action, you could, uh, well, you could generate predictions for all of them with the toolbox and then use some additivity method 
but that uh, is not embedded as such in the tool. Group. So the answer will be in practice, it's useful, but it cannot be, of course, as, as easily and nicely done as for uh, single structures. Okay, Alberto, thank you. Indeed, the uh, UVCB is uh, difficult to predict with uh, any tool. It's not only a, a problem of the tool, it is an experiment, it has limitations for, for them. So, yeah, ne next top question I see is about the possibility to save uh, sessions uh, uh, as it was possible in version 3.4, and uh, Thomas will uh, soon uh, uh, show some slides about uh, the, what will be available next month in version 4.1. The saving function is among these uh, functionalities. So, yes, it will be available end of July. Uh, then next question is uh, how does uh, the toolbox uh, handle discrepancies in the training data set? e.g. when a training substance was positive for protein binding, but the in vivo sensitization study was negative? Well, I think I will answer this question myself. Here the point is that the results of profilers are not to be intended as predictions. They are an indication of certain functional groups in the molecule that may trigger some kind of toxicity. The, the way the toolbox works is that uh, if uh, it finds uh, this uh, structural alert uh, in uh, your target uh, substance, then uh, your target substance is, is flagged by it. Now, uh, with the toolbox, you can find the closest analog analogs which have uh, the same alert. And for these analogs, retrieve uh, the experimental uh, data uh, for, let's say, skin sensitization. Now, if uh, all these uh, structures that have an alert are also shown to be negative in the experiment, then uh, if you run a prediction, uh, the prediction will probably indicate uh, that uh, the substance is, is negative. So there could be a discrepancy between structural alerts and the experimental results, uh, exactly because uh, uh, the alerts do not have uh, 100% of, of, of accuracy, and they are not meant to have that. They are an indication. What makes the difference then is the experimental value for closest analogs associated with the um, alert. So this was answered to this uh, question. Uh, then uh, here I see the, the next question is, uh, there was an add to category option uh, which uh, allowed entering two or more molecules in parallel and to do the profiling so that uh, one could see the differences, how this could be done in this version. I think that uh, part of it, we have seen it uh, in uh, Doris' presentation, but anyway, uh, Alberto wants to uh, answer. Yeah, well, actually it's about uh, how to enter the data. And again, both Doris and me have so several ways. So you could use the query plugin, as Doris uh, has, has shown by entering several cross numbers. You could use one of the options I saw, so create a document with a notepad of any text editor, and at the at the enter the smiles there, separated by by enter, and then you could enter that list, and it will appear in a matrix in parallel as uh, this question makes. If you put uh, the smiles and you put the cast number, tab the name, and then tab the smiles, you can enter the molecules with identifiers in parallel. So uh, there are there are several ways to, to do it. Uh, but I guess is importing a list of substances not on, done in Notepad, it's uh, your best chance as we have, as we have shown. Okay, Th thanks Alberto for this uh, addition. So uh, yeah, uh, we have a few more questions in the list, but we also have uh, some uh, suggestions uh, uh, in the pool we opened on how to further improve the toolbox and maybe before moving to the, the, the last questions we will address uh, we can uh, uh, just comment a little bit on, on the suggestions. I see that those suggestions speak about the reliability of uh, data and uh, that the data reliability should somehow be addressed. Uh, well, uh, we recognize uh, the problem I and mean, in this respect we have uh, added uh, some functionalities that, that uh, uh, show the consistency in the database, what kind of data uh, are available in the database. But of course, uh, uh, developing uh, reliability scores as such for data database 
um, it's, uh, it's it's tricky in in many in many ways, and one of these being that the data is donated to the toolbox. So we take them when we we think they are of uh, sufficient quality, but then to review them uh, systematically that would be another story. Also, we see suggestions about uh, mm, better integration with the uh, Euclid. And uh, honestly, when um, we switched our system to Euclid 6, uh, it, uh, we had a hard time to reconnect all our uh, tools uh, to, to the new version and structure of uh, Euclid. And uh, as Thomas will show soon, uh, Toolbox in the next version should should have a better integration with uh, with the Euclid uh, uh, 6. Okay, then uh, we will see for. Um, so um, all the other points that um, maybe we don't manage to address uh, uh, today, if uh, we answer in writing and then we published on the OECD Toolbox uh, um, website, uh, the, the, the written uh, uh, Q&A. Uh, yeah. So maybe as a, as a last uh, last question before uh, we move uh, to Thomas' uh, presentation, I see that uh, the question is: Can we use the TSR toolbox prediction to allow CLP categorization? Well, uh, this is uh, in theory is possible as long as you have uh, enough uh, data which uh, would allow that. Let's say that uh, you want uh, to predict uh, if a skin sensitizer is a strong sensitizer or a weak sensitizer. If you would have enough data points uh, with uh, EC3 values and LLNA and good analogs, then uh, you predict the quantitative value or uh, some uh, toxicity values for uh, human health. If you have the, the exact number, then in theory, this uh, prediction can be used for CLP categorization. Now, we also know that uh, in some cases, the scales are different. And for example, skin sensitization data in the toolbox might be only in the positive, negative uh, scale. And in this case, if you have a positive, you don't know who, if which category it will correspond in CLP. So in this case, it will not be possible. Of course, in, the, in this respect, we are working on it. And some of the profilers in the future, we are trying to recalibrate them according to the, the new CLP. Uh, classes uh, so that the profilers as such can give you uh, more precise indication uh, about uh, how, how strong the kind of sensitizer is. And uh, at this point, I think it's time uh, for uh, the uh, last uh, slides and uh, closing messages, uh, first from uh, EK and then from uh, OECD. So, uh, Thomas, uh, if you can uh, please uh, present what is going uh, to be available in the Toolbox version 4.1. Um. Do you want us to switch to Echo 1? No, no. Uh, sorry. No. Okay. Yes, we have two screens and the slides are on the front screen. Okay. 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 okay thank you, Andrea. So, as we got a lot of questions about functionalities, you realize probably those which use the QSR Toolbox version 3.4 realize that some very useful functionalities were missing in version 4.0. We would like to apologize for that. Main reason is that, you know, Toolbox 4.0 was completely restructured and re-engineered re to, to be updated with the newest IT developments and newest IT platforms. So that therefore, we did not manage to uh, implement all features which were available for version 3.4. We are doing our best to, to implement as many features as possible in the version 4.1, which which will release in July, and uh, among those are almost all which you requested in your in your questions, because save and load function that you can save your work, your prediction, and then load it to continue or to share with your colleagues will be implemented in this version. Then a data matrix export, which is uh, that you don't need to 
uh, do the, any prediction to export your current data matrix will be as well available in version 4.1. Then um, you will get additional indicator of other performance uh, uh, regarding of versus all uh, all endpoints in the data matrix. So you will be able to judge yourself or see yourself how specific profiler uh, performs versus endpoint of your interest. Then there is another feature because we, as you've seen, as Doris showed you, the information about the composition is now implemented in the toolbox. However, majority of donated databases is not reporting compositions. They were all collected for mono constituents or those informations were not available. Except of ECACAM, which has the information on compositions. Therefore, all other databases were unspecified we will we will switch this to mono constituents just to not confuse our users. So then, whether whenever it is there is mono constituent uh, substance from ECACAM, it will be combined with those coming from other databases. Then you will have a visualization of uh, prediction domain um, that you can see how the domain was uh, was built like it was in the previous versions. And then Euclid six already in version four zero. You can export your prediction to Euclid 6 via using web services. It is quite straightforward. If you have at the same, even in the standalone version, if at the same computer you have a Euclid 6 installed and the toolbox, you can already now export your work and your prediction from, from the toolbox to Euclid. Now, what we will implement in version 4.1, it will be as well that you will be able also able to import the data from Euclid, your Euclid instance to the toolbox. So you can you can as well upload your, your data set which you already have in your Euclid instance to the toolbox. Then uh, the query tool will cover as well ECACAM database. So you can query not only uh, other databases but as well ECACAM database. And you will be able to visualize uh, correlation between endpoints. So you can see how one endpoint, endpoint A correlates with endpoint B. For example, if you want to um, examine the relevance of some 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 data, then there are many other pro properties. I will not uh, try to cover them in the big um, in the big um, uh, detail. But uh, point eleven is about calculating parameters for mixtures. So those of of, of of you which are interested in trying to predict the properties of mixtures of UVCB, this might be the very useful feature. For, for for you, the, uh, it will be possible to load the list of cast numbers to, uh, to uh, identify corresponding structures, and then there are some few as well um, uh, functionalities which will be identified. We got as well the questions about what about other QSARs if they are implemented in the QSAR toolbox, and um, this enhance. Enlarging the amount of the QSAR tools or predictors which are available in the toolbox is one of our priorities for, this, for the next two years. And I think the first step will be to as well in incorporate direct link to the uh, Danish QSAR database, which, com which contains many predictions for many substances using many, many different QSRs. So this will be our first step. Second step will be the well dynamic link to the um, QSAR the QSAR repository, when you can basically re uh, upload your own Q QSAR model, validate it whether or not it is working, and then once it is validated, it will exhibit the service which you can access them from the toolbox. So those are the plans for the future. It is after version 4.1. Maybe it will be implemented in version 4.2 or 4.3. This we'll see. And just to, to conclude, I think that um, Quite important message is that, of course, we, we invest a lot of efforts and a lot of um, time to make Toolbox more user-friendly. But still, some level of expertise is requested. You, you, you need to know what, you, what endpoint you need to predict. You need to understand what are the main factors which drive toxicity or effects for your endpoints. And this is something which is very hard to avoid. So we are still assuming the toolbox is not the magic toolbox, it's the QSAR toolbox. So it will assist you to make your decisions to try to see whether or not you have a data in the publicly accessible 
uh, databases, whether you, you or not you have a data gap, and then can assist you to fill this data gap if you will identify it. But of course, does not mean that if you will use the toolbox and do your prediction, it, it, it gives you the the automatic um, warranty to be ac accepted. All case are, the cases are different, therefore we are as well evaluating them on the case by case basis. And then I hope you already realize that Toolbox gives you already a lot of features, a lot of functionalities which are very useful to, to build uh, consistent categories and build your own prediction in the transparent manner. For many endpoints, but there are many, but there are well endpoints, especially more complex ones, uh, like high-tier human health endpoints, which for which we don't have enough knowledge to build to build them in in the profilers and to give you these mechanistic tools to group your chemicals. And therefore, we as well work a lot just on the uh, data export functions that where toolbox has uh, has his limitation. You can still gather still all your data. And export them in the in the consistent way in the data matrix in order to in order to to work continue your your expert work later on. So, and I think saying that I would like to thank you. And this is and probably I will pass the floor to Eva for the last remarks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks, Thomas. Just to close things off for today, I would just uh, I would just want to provide uh, some acknowledgments. So first of all, to the uh, OECD QSAR Toolbox Management Group. This has been a group that's been, been in place for more than uh, 10 years now, with representatives from member countries around the world, uh, from industry and from and NGOs. And uh, they've really been uh, pushing the toolbox forward, uh, debating issues, agreeing on some of them, not agreeing on some of them, uh, providing ideas and, and suggestions, um, peer reviewing, uh, doing testing on new versions, uh, donating their expertise and, and databases and, and profilers. So there's a lot of appreciation that goes to this group, which has really uh, been dedicated to the tool uh, over the years uh, and to seeing uh, its advancement. And we um, look forward to further in engaging with this group uh, moving forward. Also, I, I want to um, yeah, note that the, the toolbox is uh, co-owned by OECD and, and ECHA. And uh, I'd like to thank ECHA for their continuing support, not just financial support, but the considerable technical support uh, in developing uh, the toolbox and in further disseminating its use. Uh, and like you saw today, um, being really um, expert uh, advocates and ambassadors of, of the toolbox. So thank you to uh, for today to Andrea, Alberto, and Doris, uh, and Tomas for all the presentations and the whole QSAR and computational team at ECHA. I'd also um, want to mention LMC, the Laboratory of Mathematical Chemistry, uh, who is the contractor developing the toolbox. Uh, there's a whole team in Bulgaria that's been very dedicated uh, to the toolbox uh, and its advancement, and we really appreciate uh, their work on the toolbox. Also for version 4.0, 4, uh, 4 uh, the report of John Morris and that half that were also subcontractors um, in development of the toolbox. Finally, as you've seen, the toolbox is really a collection of what's out there in toxicology and we hope to uh, make it and continue to make it grow. And this has been possible through numerous 
donations of databases and profilers and information from government, industry, and academics. And uh, we thank you very much for that. That's how the tool is possible. And uh, if you have any ideas for new donations, we're always help, uh, look, look forward to, to hear about uh, new data sources, et cetera, that can be incorporated. So you have here the link for the TSAR toolbox. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, the recording of this webinar will be made available uh, on the toolbox. Uh, website, and uh, we thank you all for your participation uh, in the webinar today.